2017, Sacramento City Fire Department had a vision. It knew that it had to do better in active shooter events. Although it was running through drills, it was failing objectively at its overall mission and goals. And what I mean by objectively is that if you measure the time frames to get victims from the time of injury to surgery, the times were too long. When we roll back and looked at the wound data status from the Vietnam War, we knew that we needed about 45 minutes to get someone from the time of injury to surgery. But if you ran through these drills, an active shooter using RTF, it was taking about 45 minutes to get a single victim out of the building. So we had this vision, we knew we needed to do better, and it met our mission of saving lives. So we started to put out some goals. We said, let's actually start over and start from square one and start with the research. So we assembled a team of researchers, two MPS grads, some people that had a lot of combat experience, some people that actually proctored a lot of the Rescue Task Force drills. And we read everything. We went out and read every report we could find. We read every article, every after action report, all of the FBI and Secret Service data that we can find so we could get our bounds on what the problem was. And after doing all of this research, we started to define our terms. And this is where we found some of our big challenges. When we started to have the conversation about active shooter, we realized we needed three big terms we needed to define. Security, victims versus patients, and zones of operation. The problem was, was that when you said the word secure, it meant something different to law enforcement officers than it did to the firefighters. If you used the word clear or safe, that also meant something different as well. So we went back and we said, all right, look, here is the definition of secure. Secure means you have the ability to return effective fire. And that is what firefighters are looking for, is they're looking for a secure zone to work in. Not necessarily safe, because none of these events are ever going to be safe. And we're not looking for clear because that takes too long. Our goal was speed, we were looking for secure. Then we started to talk about the difference between victims and patients. And this was key, because victims get hemorrhage control and rapidly extricated out of the building. But most of us medics were used to dealing with patients. Patients get triaged, treated, and transported. But inside of a threat zone, that takes way too long. So we had to explain to all of our paramedics, this is the difference between a victim and a patient. Victims, rapid hemorrhage control and extrication out of the building. Now, the final thing we had to talk about was zones of operation. And this was one of the biggest challenges for us. Because if you look at the typical doctrine, it'll talk about hot, warm, and cold zones. The challenge with that was, was that we already use those terms in a hazmat world. Being a hazmat specialist, those have very specific meanings to me. They draw concentric circles, which is a challenge when you're dealing with an active shooter. Because when you're dealing with an active shooter, you want to talk about lines of fire, not necessarily concentric circles. And if you bring in a bunch of people from the fire service that are used to hazmat calls, and you tell them hot, warm, cold, they behave in a certain way, and they think about the call in concentric circles, and it doesn't become very useful. So in our research, we found the original terminology that was meant for this out of the TCCC document, talked about direct threat zones, indirect threat zones, and evac zones. And when we started to use that different terminology, it made very clear sense to our people that it didn't matter how close we were to the bad person, as long as we weren't in their lines of fire, as long as we weren't in their direct threat, we could actually go into the same building, which got us closer to the victims much faster. So when we started to talk about we said, we don't go in direct threat zones, that is in a line of fire, but we will go in indirect threat zones, which can put us on the other side of the wall of the bad person, but still get to the victims. And there are no cold zones on these events. There is no zone that is safe, but the third zone we'll talk about is the evac zone. That is the goal of where we get the victims to. Once we define those terms, we were able to have useful conversations of how to speed this process up. We don't go into direct threat zones, we go into indirect threat zones. And we are working with victims, not patients, which means we control the bleeding very fast and we get them out of the building. And our goal is to get them to the evac zone. Then we just applied the scientific process and we started to test. 
we used live bodies instead of any sort of mannequins or cardboard cutouts so that we could deal with the challenge of actually moving full-size people. And we learned very quickly that's actually where the challenge in these events are. It's not necessarily getting firefighters into the threat zone. It's moving 20 live victims out because that takes a ton of work. We ran these drills in phases, meaning that we tried one drill. We said, let's try and use a real life scenario. We started with the Pulse nightclub. We filled up a building with 26 live victims that had a 200 foot long drag. And we timed everything to see how quickly we could get our people safely into the threat zone, control image on the victims, and then move them out. And as we drilled and tested, we started to get faster and faster because we used a very open mind. We started off with equipment that was suggested and then we realized it didn't work, threw it out. We realized our biggest problem was actually moving victims and we wound up with something called a foxtrot, which is a short little drag sled that allowed us to drag victims very quickly down hallways and around tight corners. Um, as we drug these sleds up and down this building, we got faster and faster on how to maneuver them. We stopped bringing in a bunch of equipment and really downsized what we brought in, limited it to 10 tourniquets, some chest seals, and glow sticks. That was for marking the deceased. And each rep, we got faster. We continued to observe, measure, and adjust every step of the way. After we got out of our original test environment, we actually moved into a real life nightclub that we found downtown. We filled that nightclub up with 50 live victims, 26 of them that needed to be extricated out onto the street. We brought in patrol officers from Sacramento City or Sacramento Police Department that didn't really know what was gonna happen in the drill and we ran it so that they just went in, suppressed the threat and then escorted us into the victims and we timed it. And instead of 45 minutes out onto the street, which we would have taken in the normal diamond formation, we actually got all the victims out on the street in nine minutes, which was very fast, and that included hemorrhage control. Each time that we measured and adjusted, we just got faster and faster. Now, what we eventually wound up with is to describe the end result of all this experimentation and 120 drills, if you count our reps, we ran 120 drills in multiple environments. The ultimate end state was, was instead of a rescue task force, which ran into diamond formation, four firefighters surrounded by four law enforcement officers escorted into the threat zone, uh, that was very cumbersome. It took a lot of training to move because firefighters don't move well in a diamond formation. They need freedom of movement, especially if they have the heavy workload of moving live victims. So we transitioned from what you would typically consider a diplomatic protection maneuver into what you now call an ink blot maneuver, where we allowed the law enforcement officers to go in and key one, suppress the threat and use all of their resources to lock that threat down. Then build a hasty corridor to escort in firefighters, not four at a time, but 20 at a time in groups to get to those large number of victims. Because it is a ton of work to do bleeding control and extricate all of those victims out in a short period of time. And each time we ran this rep, our times went from 45 minutes down to our slowest time of 12 minutes, our fastest time of six minutes. So that means from the time the firefighters broke the plane of a building with a 200 foot long drag and 26 live victims spread out over five rooms out to the evac zone with all victims our slowest time was 12 minutes. Our fastest time was six minutes. When we modeled out the transportation of all of these victims to our local hospitals using our ambulances, the last victim hit the trauma center in 26 minutes. That means that we were well within our original vision. We wanted to be faster than 45 minutes from time of injury to surgery. And using this ink blot maneuver, we were getting there. We were getting much faster. We were starting to hit all of our goals. Collaborating with SPD, 
on a daily basis got us to this goal. The Sacramento Police Department was amazing. We ran through drill after drill at Tactical Village and the law enforcement officers got better and better at building hasty corridors. They actually liked the maneuver because it was easier for them. They realized that they spent most of their energy managing firefighters in a diamond formation. Once we broke out of that mentality and told them suppress the threat and build a corridor, they were much more faster. We hit our goals faster because we got all the victims out lined up ready to transport and later her mission and ultimately our vision. So as we're looking back on this and you realize we've made some changes to the standard practice of rescue task force into something we're now called rescue strike team. The reason for that specific terminology is a task force is a mix of unlike units trying to meet one mission. Whereas a strike team is a mix of units that are all the same. And that's what we got to is law enforcement officers, you just work the Hartford Consensus Threat Acronym. You suppress the threat and then bring us in to control the hemorrhage. We'll rapidly extricate, we'll assess, and we'll prep the victims for transport. That change is a great iteration into where we should continue to go. I'll read this quote from Einstein. The important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. So if you're listening to this and you yourself have had struggles with the RTF because of the rigid diamond formation and the challenge it is, how logistically heavy it is to escort firefighters into a threat zone and then figure out how to get victims back out in that same formation. Listen to this. This is the next great iteration, but please don't stop here. Continue to experiment and drive this forward because the faster we get victims out of the threat zone to the evac zone and to surgery, the more lives we'll save. Thank you. Every law enforcement agency we work with actually loved it because it was so much faster for them to suppress the threat and build a hasty corridor. Our exposures with law enforcement was an issue with Sacramento Police Department and then CHP, who was our partner in the capital region for Sacramento, uh, and then some DHS officers. We ran a drill at CalPERS, which is a large building in downtown Sacramento. We put 15 live victims in there. It was in coordination with uh, DHS and CHP. CHP had never seen the maneuver before. They expected the drill to take about an hour. Um, after our first rep, we had all the victims out on the street in six minutes ready for transport. And at that point, CHP was bought in as well. Uh, so they actually love the maneuver because it takes less training and they can focus on just one task, suppress the threat, and then building a corridor for us. So those medical sleds are what we call the Foxtrot. It is a short drag sled. Um, we put them on every vehicle uh, in the fire department now and they would be a great tool if you're thinking about building bleed kits for something uh, that like the Hartford Consensus suggests where in large arenas you have bleeding control areas. If you stage Foxtrots with those, that would be fantastic because we know that uh, a group of five or four firefighters can easily move about five victims out, but they max out at about 10 victims. The more foxtrots they have, the more victims they can move. So if you're starting to get to the higher numbers, that extra equipment will really help us. This is the first rollout nationally. Yes, this is regionally what Sacramento and SPD and CHP are going to do in the capital region. Um, and Sac Metro has been a Sac Metro Fire Department has been a great partner as well. Uh, they'll be using similar tactics. This is this is the first introduction nationally for this. We kept this in the incubator for two years to keep testing it and running it over and over again to make sure that we got it right. So Tim List, if you're interested in coming down and working with us, it's an open invitation. Uh, anytime we run through a drill, and you can reach out to me, but. Nationally, we think this is a great solution for most agencies that have any sort of active, active shooter threat. 
The Iqbal maneuver is essentially controlling area so that logistics can come in behind you and move uh, people in and out. So you think of your firefighters as your logistics. The Iqbal maneuver is law enforcement going in and securing certain buildings or certain rooms. Um, and that definition of secure is the ability to return effective fire. So as law enforcement goes in and pushes back onto the active shooter, if they leave people behind or set up a hasty quarter, they'll control that area. Once they control that area, we'll consider that the indirect threat zone. If there's victims in there, firefighters are now willing to go into that area and rapidly extricate those victims out. We know that the faster we get our firefighters out of the building and the victims out of the building, the safer it is for all the law enforcement and the firefighters as well. So the ink blot is just simply a growing area of security that moves on through the building as law enforcement pile in. Law enforcement, as we've trained them at Tactical Village, uh, they know they have contact teams. And once the contact teams have locked down the threat, Everybody that comes in behind is holding a hasty corridor. And they are actually assigned, they're incredibly well trained when we work with uh, the police department and CHP, to hold a door or to hold a region. And they know their main goal is to stay there so that fire can follow them in and then come back out. They know that they're not to make, uh, chase anybody down or open up an area. That is the job of the contact teams. Every unit has a PAL kit and a Foxtrot. So every ambulance, every truck, every engine. Um, and what we would like to do, we'd actually like to get more Foxtrots. Uh, one Foxtrot per engine or ambulance, we learned is now our limiting factor. We can fit all the necessary gear we need in the single PAL kit, which is that large fanny pack, because when we're going into a building, we're moving fast and we're just looking for tourniquets, glow sticks, and chest seals. Uh, but every rig now has a fox shot as well. We'd like to get two fox shots per rig. That was all about the original conversation of defining our terms. The only way that we worked through that was actually focusing on the word secure. The challenge was that you've got a group of firefighters and law enforcement into the room, you would say something and they would all imagine a different scenario. When we locked it down to secure simply means you have a law enforcement officer in that room or that quarter who was able to return effective fire. And then we all knew, okay, well then that is as good as it's going to get in an environment like this. We're not looking for safe or clear. Clear takes too way long. It's never going to be safe, but our job is to save lives and get victims out. So that was the breaking point of when we said, okay, if we have law enforcement in that room, that room is secure or that hallway is secure, then we are coming in. Surprisingly, once we got through the conversation and ran the drills and the firefighters knew what their job was and their job was to focus on following the escort into the building and getting the victims out, they were absolutely fine with doing that. Even as we used sim rounds around them, we started firing off uh, sim rounds in the same building with them. They weren't distracted at all. They're actually very focused on getting the victims. And I think you're correct. RTF, the diamond formation, is so logistically heavy, it takes so much training to move in a formation like that, uh, it actually becomes distracting for the firefighters. If they're simply given a job, say, look, follow the escort in, you have a hasty quarter set up, this building is secure, uh, law enforcement is, you can trust them, they're doing their job, they focus on the victims getting them out very quickly. So the PPE that we landed on for our medics and firefighters going into this threat zone is we're wearing our yellow so we look like firefighters. We went down the rabbit hole of plate carriers or what is typically called a, uh, you know, your bulletproof vest. And going through that, we found that that is a very specific type of equipment that takes training and has a lot of nuance behind it. Uh, meaning that if you are typically wearing your law enforcement plate carrier, it covers about 15% of your critical zones. If you are trained to square up on your threat, we are not trained to square up on our threat. More than likely, we're going to be caught in a downward position over a victim or dragging, and then it turns into a ricochet plate for us. It also slows us down and is hard to move in. And when speed was our ultimate goal, our goal was to get in the building and out of the building. In addition to those plate carriers, 
They also have to be custom fitted, stored in a certain manner. Uh, they do expire over time. So it was, there was a lot of cost for really no gain other than slowing us down. The best metaphor we could find was that turnouts, the turnouts that firefighters were, take a ton of training and time to learn to move in. And it would be like pulling law enforcement out of their typical equipment, throwing them in turnouts with an SCVA and asking them to move around in the building. That's what we were doing with our plate carriers, our bulletproof vests. They were slowing us down and they were cumbersome. So we went to, let's wear our yellows, let's get in that building as fast as, let's get in and get out as fast as possible. So we are gonna start moving into the idea of, uh, from not only active shooter, we've gone through most of the threats, except now we are talking about fire as a weapon. Um, and that is becoming a in-depth conversation with CHP right now since they monitor the Capitol. Um, and we have to be specific about fire as a weapon, not fire as a distraction or desperation because that typically is how we see it uh, empirically through the real life events is that someone lights a fire out of desperation or a distraction to get away. The idea of this is if somebody actually plans, an intelligent actor with a nuanced idea plans something with fire as a weapon, the challenges of mixing law enforcement and fire to suppress two threats simultaneously. The threat of the spread of fire while you also have the threat of an intelligent actor. Um, and that is, our, that is our next project. And we're working actively with CHP and their SWAT team right now to kind of vet through that problem. Uh, we did, yeah, we, we escalated that to phase three in what is called Tactical Village, uh, which is where the SWAT team trains. And uh, we did use uh, sim rounds. Uh, when we actually built our scenarios for the Pulse nightclub, we used multiple rooms, we turned out the lights, uh, we blasted the music loud, and as the firefighters were in there, we had sim rounds go off uh, in the building next door. Uh, they, they actually did really well. Uh, the next scenario we did where we had uh, live sim rounds was we ran the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting scenario, which is a really complicated problem space for law enforcement because they have to go upstairs, they get caught in a hallway. And we ran the exact same scenario where one of the SWAT officers gets shot in the upper arm and has to be pulled back to fire. And at that time, shots were going off the entire time as firefighters were in the room. But once they had the terminology defined in their head, they knew that they were secure and they were in indirect threat zone and they had a job to do, which was remove victims to the evac zone, um, they behaved very well. Uh, it was surprising once they knew what their mission was, uh, how fantastic they did. Uh, so the idea of fire as a weapon is, there aren't, there aren't any empirical cases that I know of right now, um, but if someone were to uh, break into a secure area and start fires as they moved through a building uh, and also acted as an active shooter, how would we respond to that threat? Because that is two concurrent threats running at the same time. The challenge is, is that I don't know of any real good case studies to use to unpack that problem. Whereas if you want to talk about active shooter, you can pull from multiple case studies and go through those problems. Um, but the fire is the weapon. We don't have any real good case studies, but it is the, uh, it is the current fear of, uh, I think, CHP right now and how to work through that problem. Um, so it would be somebody who actively planned to start a fire uh, to do damage and harm and also was able to function as an active shooter. No, uh, neither. And I don't have any private responders in, uh, we, are, we are all uh, state or local government responding in that region. Uh, so we're self-insured through workers' comp. Uh, so no, it didn't affect it at all. That wasn't even a, wasn't even a question. Now that you've seen the basic concept of actually using an ink blot maneuver, you can research that. That is uh, been out there. It's a military maneuver. You actually have some MPS uh, thesis is based on it. You can also feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I am willing to answer any questions and take suggestions. Like I said, this is a constant work in progress as it should be, uh, pushing forward. 
and realize that if, if you start over and do your research and read the original TCCC documents and go through the Hartford Consensus and start from simply objectives, I think you'll wind up in the exact same space. The goal is to get the victims to the hospital as fast as possible.